We're going to start with information that has not been on Nuclear Hot Seat before. These are outtakes from the interview with Allison Katz of Independent WHO. The information she gave was so rich and so full that we simply did not have room for all of it on the one-hour podcast. Last week's encore presentation of our interview with her blasted wide open any illusion anyone might have had that the World Health Organization is actually looking after the world's health when it comes to exposure to nuclear radiation. Here from the original interview is her information on background politics within the United Nations, the impact of the independent WHO demonstration outside of WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, and a major flaw in their statistical analyses after Chernobyl. This last piece will provide a perfect springboard into the segments with Joseph Mangano. First, Alison Katz gives a comprehensive overview of the geopolitics of the WHO, how it functions, who's actually in charge, and how it has been used to manipulate our understanding of nuclear technology on our world. I think if it's interesting, we we should just have have a little look at the geopolitics of the World Health Organization and the UN and how they function, because I'm not sure that the general public really understands that. In principle, WHO is run by its member states. They make up the governing bodies. But in reality and in practice, as everywhere in the world, it isn't all member states. They are not all equal. And in the area of uh, nuclear power, three, it is the big three. It is the United States, it is the United Kingdom, and it is France. If you like, you could uh, enlarge that to the G8. But basically, who determines policies in this area, USA, UK, and France? Now, the World Health Assembly is the place where decisions are made. It's the, the, the biggest big meeting once a year with all the member states. It ought to be democratic, but of course it is not. And I would say that decisions are made in the corridors of power. And there's, in addition to that, bar, there is bargaining going on in all kinds of different fora. I'll just give you one example. There is only one international organization that actually has any real power, and that is the World Trade Organization. So just to explain how little power the World Health Assembly has. A country can easily be persuaded to vote a certain way at the World Health Assembly in exchange for important concessions at the World Trade Organization. That kind of thing is terribly depressing because what it really means is that an organization like the World Health Organization, which may be very important to the public, but it simply isn't important to governments who are only interested in economic affairs, it would seem. Um, And so this is how we understand that at the World Health Assembly, public health can be sacrificed, if you like, for economic interests that are being negotiated in quite another fora. It, it, it's quite complex, but I think it's important that everybody understands that. Uh, there's another point that I think we should understand, that in terms of undue influence, we've seen that there are powerful governments, but there's also the private sector. And today, WHO is heavily, some people would say WHO is overwhelmingly directed by private interests. And, of course, the powerful member states are promoting the interests of their transnational corporations through the World Health Organization at the World Health Assembly. And that, again, is a dreadful reflection of the fact that governments themselves, national governments themselves, are so influenced by the private sector. One one additional very worrying trend is that Um, Another major conduit for influence by the private sector is millionaire, I call it millionaire philanthropy. Of course, the most well-known of these is the Bill Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which today carries undue weight in WHO. Um, In fact, he is the foundation is giving more money to WHO than any other member state, including his own. Uh, I think that is the case today. So what we have at the United Nations is plutocracy rather than democracy. In other words, it is money that is ruling. But it, it is only the reflection of plutocracy in our own national governments.
With more than seven years of five-day-a-week, 52-weeks-a-year protests at WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, one might expect a reaction from employees who have to walk past it every workday. According to Alison Katz, the answer is both no and yes. Getting back to the protests that you have been doing for seven years now, how do the employees of WHO react, and what, if any, impact have you had upon them? Yes, I have to say that the employees of WHO, they're, they're, they're a fairly apolitical group who, like, who simply, I, I, I hate to be dismissive, but mostly just in, in, enjoy a very nice situation and are not, are, are, do not want to get involved in anything that resolves, resembles a demonstration or a protest. So at the beginning, I think that what we were seen as was, you know, a nice bunch of people, naive eccentrics as environmental activists are always seen, you know, until some absolutely dreadful catastrophe happens. So when Fukushima happened, I have to say that there was, there was a significant change. And there are very many signs of sympathy and interest since Fukushima. There, there were a few before Fukushima, but since Fukushima, I would say that the employees of WHO and also many visitors not only give us you know, the thumbs-up sign of encouragement. Uh, uh, quite a lot have come to visit us to talk about the action, and um, I think that they now probably are saying to themselves, well, they're not just a bunch of eccentrics. They've really got something there, and I need to look at it carefully. That's, of course, what we are hoping. I then asked her what kind of impact the independent WHO demonstration is actually having. In terms of impact, it's always extremely difficult to know what kind of impact you're having. You don't expect an overnight transformation. We all know these are very long-term struggles, and let's remember that we are facing the world's most powerful lobby. But I'd say that the issue of WHO shows independence, lack of independence, sorry, is becoming known. We are an embarrassment. There are all kinds of visitors to WHO, including, of course, all the ministers of health, scientists, public health officials, and so on, and they, they see these big signs when they enter WHO. And, of course, I don't doubt that many of them do ask the people they come to see at WHO, well, who are those people? Have you met with them? What are you doing about it? Um, WHO is certainly discredited today to some extent in this area, despite as we were saying, the fact that it does carry considerable prestige. I think in the area of radiation and health, it is somewhat discredited. More and more people are sceptical of its claims of 50 or so deaths from Chernobyl and so on. And with Fukushima, that scepticism is growing very, very fast. The public seems to understand that the whole truth has not been told. Then Allison elaborated on one of the major flaws with the way the WHO compiled its statistics on Chernobyl radiation exposures and the impact that they had upon the world's health. Just to go back to a second major flaw, is to average exposures over territories and populations. And this is as absurd as taking an average temperature of all patients in a hospital. It means because fallout is uneven. It's patchy. The only accurate way to calculate is through a whole body measurement in an individual, and that is studiously not done, except by independent institutes. Um, as I say, children are many times more vulnerable and fetuses a hundred times more. In addition, people who live a hundred meters apart can have suffered incredibly different exposures. There's another way in which they average, and this is another major flaw. They fail to take into account different effects inside the body in different organs. And this is critical. You cannot just average out radio contamination over the body as if it was a sort of bag of water. And, of course, this is physicists' mechanistic calculation. It is not the way a molecular biologist would look at the problem. And here's another useful metaphor. It's like the bullet in a football crowd. You can claim that if you divide up the force of the bullet across the entire population of a football stadium, of course the bullet fired into a stadium wouldn't have any impact whatsoever, but that is not what happens. The bullet lodges in one of the people at the stadium and kills that person. And it would be just as absurd if you tried to average out the impact of the bullet in one body. If it lodges in the heart, the liver may be intact. In other words, if you just use common sense, and this is where I think the public 
can very easily grasp the pseudoscience that we are being fed by the nuclear establishment. One last thing is that there is no mention of hot particles. This is incredibly important. Hot particles are ignored. So we're talking here about hot particles of radionuclides, whether, whether, whether these be plutonium, cesium, strontium, all of these are highly dangerous, any of the uro uranium isotopes. One particle lodged in the lung, it will irradiate for life and it will lead to a cancer. This is what we are seeing with depleted uranium in Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine, and of course in the former Yugoslavia. Another omission is that no account is taken of the interaction of chemical and radioactive contamination. At Chernobyl, for example, an enormous quantity, huge tons and tons of lead were poured over the burning reactor in order to put out the fire. And so, there is, a there is lead contamination in the area as well as radio contamination. And uh, the interaction between the two, obviously, is, is absolutely dreadful. But no account is taken of that. That was Alison Katz of Independent WHO with additional information, the outtakes, from our interview of last week on the unholy alliance between the World Health Organization and the pro-nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency.